Thanks, Peter, for this very kind introduction, and thanks uh, for inviting me. It's a very nice opportunity for me to, to meet this group and, uh, and also to uh, bring back memories from my uh, former ties with uh, statistical institutes. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, Peter made a joke about, made fun about my title, but it, it, there is a typo in the title, the way it is written in the program. In fact, the real title is even more ridiculous, so I won't give you what it is. <laughs> Um, so this is uh, this title that I chose for this presentation is not meant to be a criticism of what this group is doing. On the contrary, uh, the idea is more to link uh, what you are doing to this uh, uh, debate now about going beyond GDP, right? And that's that's uh, the topic of my of my talk. And the sources of uh, of this talk uh, will be the following uh, papers. So the first, there is a handbook chapter that is forthcoming in the handbook of uh, income distribution, and I wanted to really stress that uh, what I will be presenting is uh, the product of collective work with uh, several co-authors, especially Eric Skokert, Kuhn de Kank. There is also some work um, uh, being done now in progress with uh, OECD colleagues, uh, and that's the occasion to pay tribute to uh, Peter's uh, home institution. Uh, there is, the OECD has been leading uh, several initiatives which are very interesting in terms of uh, uh, reforming our views on well-being and the measurement of well-being, and one of those is uh, the Inclusive Growth Initiative, and I've been working with some uh, OECD colleagues on, on implementing these, uh, these ideas. Um, I will also be advertising uh, an Oxford handbook on well-being and public policy that should appear in a few months or, or years, but hopefully in a few months, um, in which uh, Kuhn de Kank and Dirk uh, Neumann, two young colleagues, have done a comparison of various uh, uh, methods of measuring well-being, uh, which is quite nice, and it's a, a sort of really innovative exercise to try to uh, look at five different ways of measuring well-being and uh, doing that on the same data set. Um, and finally, uh, I can't resist mentioning that I have a book on Beyond GDP, this uh, Beyond GDP story, uh, done with Didier Blanchet, who is uh, working at uh, the French National Institute of Statistics. Okay, so um, all this is about, as you know, is about multidimensionality, right? And uh, the idea that um, uh, we have to incorporate many different dimensions of life in the evaluation of people's situation at the individual level and, of course, at the social level level. Um, and nevertheless, it's true that income and wealth already actually are uh, capturing a lot of multidimensionality, the multidimensionality about multiple commodities, for instance. And also when you look at wealth, uh, you are incorporating the, multi -dimen the multiple dimensions of uh, time uh, over, over life. Even risk uh, somehow can be captured in some, in some way by, by wealth. But nevertheless, uh, not uh, all of life is about just the market dimension. Non-market dimensions matter, and that's one uh, key issue that now is prominent in the debate. Social relations, especially family relations, but also occupational status and health things. Many things that are not uh, both on the market uh, matter. Uh, another point that is important is that the correlation of disadvantages uh, uh, across different dimensions uh, for people is, uh, is important. And, uh, and this is something that uh, cannot be done with the old-fashioned uh, composite indicators that first aggregate uh, over individuals by subdomains and then do a global aggregation. Uh, so we have to, uh, to do uh, the other order of aggregation. Uh, the other point that I want to uh, rely on in my talk is this idea that perhaps preferences matter. The, the weights people put on the various dimensions of their own lives may be something that is important. This is a bit more controversial, of course, uh, debated. Some people are against it, some people are strongly in favor of it, and certainly everybody will agree that it's not easy to implement. So I'll talk a bit about that. And the last consideration that is perhaps a bit less familiar to you is that fairness matters, um, and that uh, when we talk about uh, measuring inequalities, we have to do interpersonal comparisons. And to do that, we cannot just be purely empirical. We have to rely on normative principles that have to do with deciding who should get priority in, in the evaluation of the distribution, in the, evaluation of, in the determination of social uh, attention. Um, and that's something that uh, has to rely on normative principles. That's something that Lionel Robbins said a long time ago, uh, and, and it's still, still with us. We have to live with that. So these are the uh, considerations, especially the last three. I will use them more or less as a sort of list of criteria that I will 
um, uh, apply to the uh, various methods that I, the various approaches that I want to discuss with you uh, tonight. These three approaches turn out to be the three approaches that have been somehow highlighted in the, Stan, the Sen uh, Stiglitz uh, Fitusi uh, report, uh, and they are in a way the, the most salient in the, in the uh, current discussion. So the capabilities approach uh, uh, initiated by Amartya Sen uh, is well known, the happiness approach, which is now quite uh, fashionable, and the equivalent income approach uh, that I will uh, discuss uh, later. So let me take them in this order. Uh, I will discuss their pros and cons, and then I will uh, illustrate uh, them. Uh, or at least uh, some, of, some of them, because not everything is easy to, to implement, as you'll see. Okay, I will be using a very little formalism, but just a little bit. So uh, this is my framework. Uh, an, individual, an individual situation is something that is uh, a, a list of three items. Uh, the first one is a vector, and this is what I will call life. Okay, and life is made of many dimensions, potentially. Um, the second one is an ordering, so it's the preferences of this uh, individual over the object that is the first item, over live vectors, okay? And it's just an ordinal ranking, okay? It's nothing like a utility function. But then you have this third item, which is something like a satisfaction or utility function. I call it a satisfaction uh, function because I want you to think of it, and empirically uh, I will use it a bit that way, as the level of satisfaction that the individual himself or herself would declare if asked about how life is going, okay? So that's something a bit like the satisfaction levels observed in, in happiness surveys. And the goal that we have in this uh, lecture tonight is to uh, see how we can compare such situations across people, okay? Uh, so compare means uh, putting an ordering on them. Uh, sometimes we can do more than that. We can put a value on them or a numerical value. Okay, so let me start with the capabilities approach. A uh, lot of information on this slide, but let me uh, go through it. So, as you probably all know, uh, the capabilities approach is first about functionings, and functionings is everything you may uh, want to uh, list about life, beings and doings. Um, and this uh, idea of looking at functionings is obviously quite promising as far as my principle of non-market dimensions matter is concerned, right? That goes very well potentially in that direction. But um, what the capabilities approach says is that really you should be looking not at functionings but at capabilities or capability sets more precisely. And these are the sets of accessible functioning vectors that people have access to, okay? So uh, if you look at the criteria that I listed before, uh, when I said income, wealth already capture a lot of multiple uh, dimensions, uh, here you see the inspiration. The capability set is a bit like the budget set. Uh, budget set gives you a set of accessible commodity bundles, and, um, and here a capability set will uh, give you a, a bit more than that. When you look at uh, one of the most famous implementation of the capabilities approach, but very imperfect as is, uh, as is well known, the uh, Human Development Index, you see that you have uh, income there as a dimension, you have education and longevity, and uh, each of them is somehow meant to proxy uh, capability dimensions. Now, the other criteria, criterion that I had was correlation matters. This is, of course, not implemented in the HDI, which is a, a kind of old-fashioned composite index, but of course, uh, they would like to do it if they could, and uh, this, is, uh, this has to do with limitations in the data. But potentially, uh, the uh, capabilities approach can start with the aggregation at the individual level across dimensions. Uh, that could be done, in theory. Uh, the uh, next criterion was preferences matter, and that's more tricky and more uh, controversial um, in this approach. So clearly the uh, HDI, if you take it as an implementation of this approach, doesn't do that. The weights attributed to the various dimensions have nothing to do with the population preferences on these dimensions. And uh, Amartya Sen um, says two things essentially uh, about uh, the, the importance of preferences in this setting. First, because you talk about capability sets, of course people's preferences will play a role in the selection of the vectors of functionings in the set. If you offer people a set of opportunities, they will choose what they want. So there is some room for preferences there. And the other thing that he says is that 
the weights that you need to put on the various dimensions of capabilities, you still need to put weights on these dimensions. These are really value judgments about the importance of various aspects of life. And for such value judgments, what you should do is to seek a community agreement or something like that. And uh, he more precisely proposes that if you cannot reach a full consensus where everybody agrees that the weight of health is, is this compared to income and so on, then you should apply what he calls the intersection principle, which is very close to a sort of dominance principle, which can be read in this way, right? If you uh, have two uh, life uh, vectors, N L and L prime, such that for all preferences in a relevant set, uh, L is weakly preferred to L prime, then we should consider that any situation that includes L is uh, at least as good as any situation that includes L prime. Whatever the preference associated to that and whatever the satisfaction uh, function associated to that, okay? So um, this uh, object here is the ordering of uh, situations that I'm looking for. Okay, so that's the intersection principle which seems very, very intuitive. Uh, it looks at the unanimity of preferences of a relevant set, and it looks very strong, uh, very uh, very uh, appealing, I, I mean very compelling. Nevertheless, there is a problem with it. And here is the uh, example that I wanted to show. Um, suppose that life has just two dimensions, because I have a two-dimensional uh, screen here. I can hardly do with more dimensions. And uh, suppose that you start, for instance, considering the life of individual I, who is here, right? He's uh, not too badly off. Uh, certainly, he looks better off than individual uh, J. Suppose that all the preferences are monotonic in our relevant set. And um, uh, applying the uh, dominance principle, then we would say that individual I here is better off than individual J here. But suppose that these curves here represent their indifference curves, their preferences, and they have different preferences. So individual J here is better off at this point than at this point, L prime. Now, applying the dominance principle or intersection principle again, this life here, this situation here is better in all dimensions, so it has to be considered better, right? But for individual I with his preferences, this situation is actually better than this one. So you see, you have a cycle. And there is a problem there. If you want to uh, respect the uh, dominance principle and say that this situation is better than this one, this situation is better than this one, but also to respect individuals' preferences about their own situation, then you have a clash. It's impossible to do both at the same time. So when I said preferences matter as a kind of principle, I was referring more or less implicitly to this idea that we should refer to people's own views on their situation. And that's problematic. The intersection principle doesn't uh, work well in combination with, with this idea. So perhaps this is not really a true paradox. And let me try to explain why uh, we shouldn't consider this to be really a paradox or a big ethical problem, um, a big tension between two different appealing principles. I think that the dominance or the intersection principle is actually not that uh, compelling, even though it looks very intuitive. The reason is the following. A situation, even if we ignore the satisfaction function, a situation of life is at least uh, a combination of these vector of life dimensions and the preferences ordering, at least that. And uh, for the moment, let me forget the satisfaction function. So we cannot just reduce the description of a situation of an individual to just his life vector. What the individual thinks about his uh, situation and other possible situations may play a role. And so what may matter is not just the vector you have, but also the fit between the vector of life that you have and your preferences, your goals in life. And this fit adds another uh, consideration, another element to the evaluation. So what can happen is that, for instance, if you take two uh, kind of extreme uh, examples of goals in life, an athlete, for instance, may be better off with a situation where income is not high but health is good uh, than a businessman who has very different goals in life. Uh, who would have the same vector plus epsilon in all, in all dimensions? Why that? Why? Because he actually has a better fit with his preferences. He cares much more about having uh, athletic uh, potential due to good health than about his income, right? Whereas the businessman might care much more about income than health and therefore be actually worse off, even though he has better income and better health than the athlete. So the fit with the preferences may matter, okay? And similarly, if you look at a businessman with large income and poor health, he may be better off than an athlete would have even greater income and even and, and uh, slightly less poor health. 
Okay. So if you wanted to look at plausible rankings of situations for these two guys here, you would probably have to uh, imagine that we should rank these four situations somewhere on the top here because that corresponds to what they really prefer. So great health for the athlete and uh, a large income for the businessman. I don't know exactly where, whether I should put the athlete before the businessman or, or the other way around. That's a matter for discussion. And, but certainly it looks like these four situations should be at the top and the situation with the plus epsilon should be above the situation without the epsilon for each of them. And these situations which don't correspond to a good fit with their preferences should be at the bottom. So you see that no matter how you organize the athlete and the businessman here in the top tier and here in the bottom tier, you will have necessarily some violations of the dominance principle. Here you have low income great health and here you have low income plus epsilon and great health plus epsilon, which is ranked below. So that's a violation of dominance. And we have another violation of dominance here between these two situations. So it's impossible to respect people's preferences and not violate uh, dominance. So of course, you have a choice here. If you really want to stick with dominance and don't think that the fit with preferences is that important, you can do it. But then it means that you have to go all the way. And in fact, it implies that at the end of the day, the fit with preferences and the the, the, the second argument in the uh, uh, triple uh, description of situations, the preference ordering will have no role at all in the evaluation of, of situations. So that may be something that you want to think twice about it. So the alternative view that I will be playing more uh, here is this idea that weights should reflect personal preferences and then you should seek personalized indices. So the index of a situation should re really use weights which are specific to the person. The last consideration I want to mention is this fairness matters idea. So here capabilities are like opportunity sets and therefore that gives a big role to individual responsibility. And uh, Amartya Sen is explicit about that. He says, for instance, if you consider people where it's possible to have health insurance, some people choose not to have health insurance and then they have a big health problem, well, tough luck for them, okay? That was their responsibility. They had good opportunities, but good capabilities, but they didn't uh, do that. So that's controversial. And um, I've been writing against this uh, harsh view of severe view of, of responsibility and advocating an alternative view, which is somewhat more charitable, which has to do with this idea that we should at least respect preferences, but that's not uh, the same thing as, um, as uh, a letting people down when they have some unexpected problems uh, falling, falling on them. And especially, um, I mean, choice and, and freedom uh, do matter, but they should not trump everything, okay? And in particular, they do not work when you think of public goods, which have to be the same for everybody, then uh, it's more important to respect preferences than to think in terms of capabilities or opportunities. Okay, so in conclusion, the capability approach my. Uh, uh, evaluation would be it looks a bit too fetishistic on choice and opportunities um, and perhaps not respectful enough of individual preferences. Um, but whether that's an external criticism or an internal criticism, I don't know. Uh, it, it's easy to imagine that the capabilities approach could move toward a more personalized, preference respectful way of dealing with the weighting of dimensions. Um, so uh, in a way, I'm not quite sure uh, whether I'm proposing a reform of the approach or, or, or criticize, criticizing it. Okay, a few, uh, now let's move to the, uh, to the happiness approach and, and say a few words about it. So you know that there has been a surge in uh, uh, subjective well-being studies and, and some colleagues in this room have, have been uh, very important in this uh, new development. There are two branches in this literature. One is uh, somewhat more objective and looks at just at the determinants of subjective well-being at the individual level, trying to explain what makes it move. And you have a second branch where people are more interested in politi policy conclusions and social welfare uh, assessment. And especially uh, some studies look at the average uh, uh, level of satisfaction um, and use that as a criterion of, of social welfare. So much of the second branch of the literature takes it more or less for granted that subjective well-being as it is recorded in surveys is, is something that is ethically relevant, that you can use, and is meaningful, and especially that you can add up across people in a meaningful way. Okay? So it means that it is impersonally uh, comparable. An important distinction that you probably know is that there are different ways of looking at subjective well-being, different uh, sorts of subjective well-being, and the key distinction is between emotions and, um, and uh, evaluation. So emotions are just things that um, happen in people's uh, mind and heart and so on, and evaluations are cognitive judgments uh, that they uh, 
cast on their situation. Um, and here there is a distinction between satisfaction questions and uh, eudaimonic uh, or eudaimonia questions which have to do with sense of purpose, uh, fulfillment and, th and things like that. What I'll do here is mostly to focus on satisfaction uh, for the following reason. I think that it's the most promising uh, indicator if we want to do something that really captures what people are interested in in their life. Uh, emotions are of course important, but they are just a subset of uh, the dimensions of life. And not everybody is a pure hedonist that just cares about his feelings or his, uh, his happiness. Um, and so if we want to be careful about the people who are not uh, hedonists, we have to, uh, to look at a more evaluative approach. The eudaimonia uh, considerations are interesting, but perhaps we can consider them as also focusing on a sort of subset of uh, the uh, set of considerations that are dealt with with satisfaction questions which look a bit more uh, uh, general, more global. Okay, so let me use my uh, criteria again. Non-income dimensions matter, very good, very promising here. You ask satisfaction about everything that matters to people, okay? Uh, correlation matters, good again, because you ask people to make a synthesis of their situation, an evaluation of the whole thing, and so if you have correlation uh, accumulation of disadvantages over some people, that will show. Um, and um, now, preferences matter. That's a bit interesting again. It looks uh, prima facie good because you ask people, so they will use their own weights in evaluating the various dimensions of their life. And, um, but there is nevertheless a problem, as you'll see. So one first thing I wanted to say is that there is a distinction in this literature, which is interesting, between decision utility and experience utility. Decision utility having to do with how people see things in advance when they make a choice. And usually they can make mistakes about the effect on their satisfaction of what will happen. Whereas experience utility is the exposed thing uh, really what happened and whether they really enjoyed and are satisfied with, with this thing. So this is, uh, uh, perhaps we can think that um, the latter is more relevant and uh, when we ask people to um, give a satisfaction judgment about their life, we are closer to experience utility than to decision utility. So perhaps that's a good point of this approach. We are closer. So it's not like revealed preferences, which is just having to do with people's behavior, which is full of mistakes. Perhaps it's actually uh, devoid of some of these mistakes that we have with decision utility. Uh, but as you uh, probably know, there is a difficulty with interpersonal or inter-situation comparisons because the scales that people may use when they have to give a number between 0 and 10, for instance, about satisfaction with life, they, these scales may shift over uh, situations uh, over time for the same person or uh, between different people uh, being born in different situations, different cultures and so on. So this is more or less the, what is called the adaptation problem. And uh, what is uh, less well known is that uh, this approach, um, because we don't have this um, guarantee that people will use scales in the same way answering this question, we have a violation of what I would call the same preference principle. And the same preference principle says the following. If you have preferences which are identical in two situations, okay, so you have these two situations here, and the preference ordering is the same. You have two different vectors. And so the idea here, if we want to respect preferences, it makes a lot of sense to say, well, well, we should rank these two situations according to the preference ordering that is common to these two situations. So think of one individual who is uh, just uh, moving over time, getting older, but keeps his preference ordering, and consider that he has moved to a better situation, it would be strange to tell him, no, in fact, your preference, your, your situation has worsened, okay? So we respect his. And same when we compare two different individuals who happen to have the same ranking over life vectors, it seems natural to uh, respect their own evaluation, their common evaluation of their situation. So that looks like a, a, a natural extension of the idea of respecting preferences from the usual uh, application to intrapersonal situation. Uh, to interpersonal situations across people having uh, the same preferences, okay? And that will not be uh, satisfied by the, um, you see, by the satisfaction scores that people give uh, at a uh, questionnaire because when they have different uh, satisfaction functions, they use the scales in different ways, they may give answers that are uh, anything uh, in whatever direction independently of their, uh, of their common preferences, okay? Um, now, the last point is fairness matters. And again, that's something that is not uh, usually acknowledged in the literature, and it's uh, the following idea. Even if every respondent in such surveys used the same scale, 
so the, the subjective well-being scores that we get would not necessarily give a good measure. And even this idea of using the same scale is something that has no meaning, actually, when people have different orderings. Okay? It, ma it makes sense when you look at people having the same ranking, then you can ask whether they put the same numbers on the same positions in the ranking. But people having different rankings, what does it mean to say that they use the same scale? It means nothing, right? And so, um, uh, if you look at my example of the artist and the businessman, for instance, um, it doesn't make sense to say that they use the same, the same scale. And it is uh, many uh, people in the literature, especially in philosophy, have argued that comparing situations that involve different preferences, uh, that requires uh, fairness uh, principles. And it's quite usually accepted to uh, consider that it's not sufficient to just express a low satisfaction to, uh, to be worse off than others. Okay, so that's something that is a kind of folk principle. Uh, and it's reflected in a lot of the literature. And that questions this idea that um, we can use these scores uh, directly. Now, you could still say, well, but perhaps the scores are not that bad. Perhaps they are good proxies, and they are better than anything else. And that's an interesting empirical question. So the empirical question I want to raise here is perhaps we can look at, try to have good measures and compare the uh, satisfaction uh, scores that we have from this data uh, and see if they give us uh, the right answers. And I'll give examples of uh, such as studies, which uh, are not very promising, actually, that suggest that the answer is likely to be to be negative. But in uh, thinking of using these data, one thing that you can uh, still do is to go back to the, the other branch, the branch that looks at the determinants of happiness, and think that perhaps these studies of the determinants of satisfaction is something that gives you inf interesting information about people's weights over the different dimensions, people's preferences. And that's something that I will, uh, I will illustrate uh, soon. Now, um, the uh, equivalent income approach uh, is the third one I want to mention. So that's something that comes from two different origins that are uh, quite separate, actually, and it's funny that uh, they somehow converge. The first one is the fair allocation theory, in which uh, you do interpersonal comparisons of commodity bundles, uh, taking account of people's ordinal preferences. Uh, for instance, you have the no envy criterion, where you say that uh, individual I prefers his bundle to the bundle of anybody else. And you have the egalitarian equivalent criterion, which says that the bundle of individual I should be indifferent for individual I to some uh, fraction, a common fraction of a reference uh, bundle. The other origin of this uh, equivalent income approach is the monometric utility uh, initiated by Samuelson, and, and many other authors have worked on it. And the idea there was more to make budgets comparable when people face different prices. Uh, you all know that very well. I don't, I don't need to teach that here. Um, now, the uh, equivalent income, which also could be called monometric utility, is just extending this to non-market dimensions. And, and this is pretty obvious how to do it. So suppose that your vector of life is as a bit more structured than I've said so far. So it's your nominal income, a vector or price vector that you face on the market for commodities, and a vector Q of non-market dimensions, other dimensions of quality of life. So equivalent income is this quantity here, which is defined by solving this equation. Okay, this, you, have, you need to have indifference between the actual situation of the individual, who is, he has his level of income, he's facing a particular local price vector on the market, and he has uh, the non-market dimensions. He should be indifferent between this and uh, this uh, equivalent income associated with the reference uh, price vector and the uh, reference um, quality of life vector, which can be personalized. Okay. So let me say a few words about the choice of reference. Every time uh, you present this notion, people say, well, what about the choice of references? That's arbitrary. So it's not arbitrary, actually, but it's true that it's not obvious. And that's the difference between arbitrary and not obvious. Uh, and because you can talk about it. And so, for instance, uh, P star is uh, something that for consumption goods can be an average of the local prices that you have on the market. So uh, if I have the time, I'll, I'll talk about a specific proposal to use the Sitovsky curve to, uh, to find such an average. The uh, uh, quality of uh, life, uh, the non-market dimensions uh, reference, can be many things, but one appealing ex example is to take the best uh, vector that the individual would choose for a given situation in terms of uh, nominal income and uh, the reference price vector. Okay? What would be his best choice according to his preferences 
Um, now there is an issue about where you would put leisure here in this model. It's not, you can put it either in the commodities or in the uh, quality of life. Uh, both possibilities are interesting. I won't have the time to uh, say more about that here. So let me briefly go through my criteria and then I will illustrate these, uh, these things. So uh, the uh, first criteria, non-income dimensions matter. Of course, it's a part of the story. Correlation matters again. It's a bit like the previous criterion. Uh, it's about preferences of people over their whole situation. Preferences matter. How does it work uh, here? Well, the equivalent income, uh, if you use it as a function of the, um, of the uh, life vector, it's a representation. It's a utility representation of preferences. Okay. Um, now, so it will respect the uh, individual's own preferences. Does it satisfy the same uh, preference principle? That's slightly less obvious, especially when you use the uh, personalized uh, a reference uh, QI here, but it's still true. So it will actually, uh, so if you have two guys having the same preferences and they prefer one life to the other, it will happen necessarily uh, that uh, the uh, equivalent income uh, of the guy who has the better life is higher. Okay, so that, that's something that is satisfied by this approach. Now, what about fairness? Well, here you have something that is interesting, but not, not totally exciting. And what you have is the following. If you uh, look at uh, two uh, individuals who happen to face the reference price on the market and whose uh, quality of life corresponds to the reference. The non-market dimensions correspond to the reference. Then you can just look at their income and that gives you, that tells you who is better off according to the equivalent income. Why that? Well, simply because their ordinary income is the same as their equivalent income in that case. So you don't need to have more information about their preferences, how much they benefit from being at the optimal quality of life vector and so on. So that's a sort of fairness principle. Income suffices when people, for instance, all have good health and so on. The, this sort of idea, income suffices to compare people. So it's a sort of resources idea. Is it a good fairness principle? It's not a stupid one, but it's not that compelling. Okay, so that's the, the point. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's where we are. Uh, what is clear is that if you look at satisfaction levels, they don't matter at all. We just use the first two items, uh, the life vector and the preference ordering. The satisfaction function doesn't play a role. Um, and um, we have some responsibility for preferences by this idea of respecting preferences. So it can happen, we have this violation of the dominance principle necessarily because we respect people's preferences. So it can happen that you have two situations where uh, one person has more of everything than the other, but they have different preferences and uh, therefore you will end up saying that, for instance, they are equally well off, okay? And that's just because the, the person who has less in all dimensions cares less about the gap between his situation and the optimal situation according to his preferences. Okay, now I would like to illustrate a bit with empirical uh, comparisons and here we need to uh, estimate preferences in order to do that. So you all know that there are at least two uh, sources of estimations, but uh, I would like really to say that there are at least three because we have the revealed preferences, which is limited because it's limited to market choices and things like that. We have stated preferences, which have many problems, but they can still be used. And uh, now some work is being done on this by various people. And you have the satisfaction regression that I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, which can be used also. It has some problems, endogeneity, observability issues and all that. So we are not really sure that it captures preferences in any deep way, but uh, that can uh, be used. Another interesting thing about these uh, regressions with satisfaction is that the only thing you can do is to estimate subgroup preferences. You cannot estimate preferences at the individual level. So you lose a lot of inter-individual variability of preferences, which is probably bad. But on the other hand, if you don't fully trust individual preferences, perhaps the subgroup preferences are more trustworthy than, uh, than I mean, there is all this debate about uh, behavioral issues. People have uh, stupid preferences, inconsistent preferences, and so on. So perhaps the subgroup preferences are slightly less uh, inconsistent and slightly more respectable than, uh, than these things. So um, I have too much on my, uh, on my stock of slides here to show. I'll briefly go through a few illustrations. So perhaps I will uh, first start with uh, this uh, empirical illustration from Russia. Uh, done with my co-authors uh, Kun de Conk and Eric Tocquet. We were using this uh, Russia Longitudinal Monitoring Survey. Uh, seven waves have been used and we have a sample of this, uh, this size here. And the life satisfaction question is uh, the question we use, which is uh, uh, given with five uh, point scale. 
What we do is a regression uh, with individual fixed effects and time dummies, and we incorporate, so this is the log of, uh, not income, but uh, expenditures per consumption unit. And these are the uh, quality of life, the non-market dimensions, um, where what we uh, use as dimensions is primarily health, but also housing, unemployment, uh, the uh, suffering from wage arrears, occupational status, education, marital status, and, and a few other things. But we essentially focus on the first uh, four uh, dimensions. And what we have here are parameters, <coughs> sociodemographic parameters that uh, introduce uh, interaction terms allowing for uh, different preferences across subgroups in the, in the population. Okay. We have tested, uh, so we can put variables either in the, uh, this object here, which is the object of people's preferences, or in these Z uh, things, which are more the kind of scaling thing or the shape of preferences, and we have tested uh, where to, how to allocate these various dimensions uh, between these two categories uh, using things in this, in this order. Right. Um, and uh, so the subgroups that we uh, look at are these, uh, these uh, various uh, sorts of uh, people. Okay, so here is a typical uh, satisfaction regression with this sort of equation. Nothing really uh, extraordinary about it. We get the usual results. The only thing perhaps that I should uh, spend a few seconds on is the uh, fact that we have uh, significant interaction terms. So for instance, the young uh, care a bit less about health uh, than the old. Um, we have that the male and the higher educated are those who care about uh, unemployment, whereas in the uh, uh, reference uh, situation, the term is, is not significant, and, um, and a few things like that. But these are the main uh, differences. So you, you see you have, you have some heterogeneity of, uh, of preferences. And uh, now let's look at how the population is spread over uh, the uh, various uh, variables that we have. So let's first look at these expenditure uh, variables. Uh, so we are not using income, but we have equivalized expenditures. And this uh, object here is the equivalent income, okay? And so what you get here is the idea that these two things are not the same. So the fact that we uh, introduce uh, non-market dimensions, other things, than it does play a role, and people can be uh, can be well off in one dimension and badly off in the other uh, in the other dimension. Okay, so it's really uh, there is some correlation. I mean, the, the Spearman rank correlation is is close to a half, which is somewhat high, but nevertheless, it's not the same thing. Now, if you um, so we don't really implement the capability approach in a, a, in a strict sense because it's hard to know exactly what it would be. But what we do is something a bit like the HDI to to look at a typical objective measure. And here we get something where we put the same or less the same dimensions. Um, and um, we don't put wage arrears. I mean, we've tried also wage arrears, but I don't show it here. Uh, it turns out that uh, it, it sh shifts the uh, evaluation quite a lot. But uh, this is the, the case in which it looks a bit closer to what we have with equivalent uh, income. But still, it is, uh, it is not exactly the same. But the correlation, you see, is, is uh, nevertheless quite high. Now, with subjective satisfaction, this is the interesting thing. Um, is the subjective satisfaction uh, score a good proxy for a more objective evaluation of people's situation, like the equivalent income? The answer seems to be no. The, the correlation is, is low. And you see that you have, uh, it's, it's fairly possible, in particular, to be poor and to be, uh, to be at the highest level of satisfaction. Okay? It's also possible to be uh, dissatisfied even though your situation in terms of uh, equivalent income is, is pretty good. Um, so these two things are, are quite different and, um, and, and that's, um, so you cannot use such subjective satisfaction as a proxy for things which are a bit more uh, objective. Now, uh, this is just to frighten you. Um, this is a portrait of the uh, worse off population. Uh, so we look at the characteristics of the worse off population. And I won't go through the details. I just want to show the following thing. So these various columns here correspond to a different um, uh, set of characteristics that are that different variables that are incorporated, different dimensions that are incorporated in the evaluation, the computation of the equivalent income. So you start with just the, uh, here, this is the equivalized expenditures, okay? And at the end here, we have subjective satisfaction when we incorporate everything, including the random, uh, the, the residual. And um, so the first, you see that in the, the first uh, row here, you have the percentage of newcomers in the group of worse-off people that we have here. 
And you see you have a big number here, so when you introduce health as an additional dimension, it really changes the composition of the worst of subpopulation. And then not much, well, when you introduce the uh, third dimension, which is housing, it still plays a role, then not much happens uh, until you introduce the uh, character traits. The character traits play a big role, and finally the residual uh, plays a big role as well. Okay, so you completely change the population of the, of the worst of, not completely, but quite substantially uh, when, when you introduce these additional things. So the, and the portrait of these people in terms of uh, other characteristics uh, are, um, uh, are substantially changed. But nevertheless, you can see that uh, in all these things, the average life satisfaction is nevertheless rather uh, low, uh, but of course uh, quite uh, higher than uh, here. The, the subgroup that we have is the subgroup of uh, the, the number of people that we focus on for each of these things is the same number as the number of people who have a satisfaction at the lowest level, one. Okay. And so you see that uh, we are uh, above one, but still uh, rather, rather low. So it's not, not completely uh, foreign. Okay, I will skip this one, which is uh, just to show that we have the similar results in Germany. So Russia is not an exception. Uh, in, in Germany, we have uh, similar uh, exercise and similar things. So these are scatter plots of these things. So this is the, the one with equivalent income and satisfaction, um, where we see that uh, things can go um, a bit in all directions. Um, and um, let me uh, now briefly mention that the work I'm doing with the OECD colleagues, I'm glad I don't have much time to talk about it because this is really hot from the oven. Uh, they just sent me that a few days uh, before this uh, lecture and we didn't have time really to uh, check uh, to go over it. So I don't really know what it's worth. It might not be the final product at the end, but this is the kind of thing that you can do, which is to look at the uh, living standards in terms of equivalent income uh, by, uh, for different countries. Here are the, the countries where you have, and the uh, countries are ranked by equivalent income. And what we have here is actually not average equivalent income, but a social welfare function that is a kind of Atkinson social welfare function applied to the distribution of equivalent incomes using a, a co uh, coefficient of 1.5, which means that it's a bit like focusing on the median of the distribution. It's not, not quite the same, of course, but it's a bit like that. And so what you can do is to decompose uh, these kind of uh, um, evaluation of living standards in terms of the contributions of income and other dimensions. What we've done is just uh, introducing two things. One is unemployment and the other is longevity. Uh, so it's, it's fairly limited, but it's also using weights that come from a, a satisfaction regression based on the Gallup data with the ladder of life uh, question. So you can do that for living standard levels and you can do that for growth rates. Um, and this is the, these are the growth rates over the period from 95 to 2011. Okay, um, I have two minutes left and I have uh, three topics that I wanted to briefly mention. Uh, so I'll, I'll go quickly over them, just to mention that there are some interesting issues to think about and some open questions. So I will focus a bit more about the open questions now. So one uh, area of application is equivalent scales. Um, this is an area where the traditional equivalent scales actually were not really uh, equivalent income applications, unless you believe that in the unitary model of the household with a uh, utility function of the household. Um, and it has been well established now that the formal, the uh, the, the traditional approach is, is um, cannot really be identified from demand data and so on. So if you think of equivalent income, what would that mean here? Well, it would be something like asking people what income would be sufficient for them if they were to live as singles okay, and obtain the same satisfaction as their current uh, satisfaction. So this is something that is called indifferent scale by uh, Capori and his uh, co-authors in recent work. Um, now, there is an interesting uh, open question here, which is whether we should just focus on consumption utility and the way they do it, for instance, is to estimate people's preferences on the uh, private goods and the local public goods consumed in the household. So this is just about consumption utility, and you don't get the utility impact of living in a certain type of household. For instance, the utility of having children, the utility of having a partner, and that sort of things. Um, so it's just the utility of enjoying public goods and economies of scale in the, in the household. So, but we could do both. I mean, you can think of the question I ask here about how to define equivalent income. The income you would need to live as a single and obtain the same satisfaction. You can, depending on how you estimate preferences, you can incorporate uh, the satisfaction about the type of uh, household you live in or not. Uh, 
And uh, another open question that I wanted to mention is that um, the equivalent scales that have been used and are still used and, and were used in some of the, in the empirical application that I mentioned, the equivalized expenditures were still using the OECD scale. Um, it would be interesting to look at the assumptions that would make them okay, uh, okay for the uh, equivalent income approach or the indifference scale. And uh, in particular, uh, I've written a, in a paper with a colleague that it's possible to justify the uh, old OECD scale that uses the square root of the number of people in the household. If you assume that you have identical individuals in the household and the household is always spending half of its budget on the local public good, then it justifies using the OECD scale according to, the, to this notion. So this is an area that is pretty open. Let me briefly mention uh, this uh, issue of publicly provided goods, and this morning I learned that it's called STIC. Uh, so the discussion this morning was very rich, and I don't have much to add to it, in fact. Um, and just the fact that it's probably important to make a clear distinction, and Peter actually advocated that, to, between the idea of measuring adjusted income and the idea of measuring well-being. If you are after well-being, it's something that has to do more with looking at the impact of policy, public policy, on people's quality of life. And especially, for instance, if you think of health, perhaps it's important to look at the impact on health and incorporate that in the, uh, in the evaluation. So that can be done with equivalent income, um, and, and that's something that is um, uh, a bit different from computing the adjusted income. I will skip this idea. You can also look at the problem of PPP uh, indices uh, to compare uh, countries. So I have a proposal about um, a way of computing a PPP index based on money metric utilities with a reference, particular reference price. Um, but there is still an open question of quite important difficulty, even if you look at equivalent income, which is that people's preferences are presumably defined on the commodities they are used to have on the local markets. And the commodities differ from countries of very, especially when they have very different levels of development. And therefore, uh, it's uh, actually hard to think of using population preferences to do that kind of evaluation, because these preferences might just not be defined. Uh, so that's a serious challenge, and, um, and there is some work to do on that. And this is my last slide. A few uh, open questions that I wanted to uh, briefly mention. Uh, first, preferences, as I said, are presumably imperfect, and that's what behavioral economics has been uh, telling us for a few years now. Um, now, that's partly an empirical question, and it's also perhaps a question about survey design. Perhaps we should think of if we are interested in authentic preferences uh, underneath uh, people's uh, immediate uh, 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 whimsical uh, preferences, uh, perhaps we should think of new surveys that put people in better conditions to think about the options and to think about their preferences. Um, we can... Uh, perhaps deal with the fact that we have imperfect estimations of these imperfect preferences. And the, the, the connection between imperfect preferences and imperfect estimations is interesting to make and see exactly what, what is statistical and what is uh, deeper than just statistical in this situation. So we still are in need of, uh, in the empirical uh, uh, illustration that I gave, there was no uh, test of significance for all the things I mentioned, for some of them, but not all of them. So we still need some work on that. Um, a link with the literature on stochastic dominance would be interesting to make. This literature has not yet uh, incorporated this uh, possibility of having diverse preferences. So usually it assumes uniformity of preferences, but then looks at how to get uh, results which are robust to the uh, specification of these common preferences, this common utility function. Uh, so some work needs to, to be done to connect to, to that in some fashion. For instance, uh, we need to have a workable um, a test for uh, checking robustness with respect to the uh, reference parameters that I mentioned when you do, for instance, uh, the equivalent income. Um, the list of uh, dimensions is something that is uh, mysterious. We usually focus on a small list. Is that a big mistake or not? Uh, so the illustration I gave about Russia suggests that beyond three, four dimensions, not much happens unless you go to the full uh, character traits and, and residuals and so on. But um, is that true? Uh, it, would, it would require confirmation. It's, it's quite important to know whether we make big mistakes if we forget uh, the last uh, two, three dimensions that may matter to people. Um, and uh, that has to do, of course, with the data that are available. Are we really asking the right questions? Um, we don't have a good theory of what a preference uh, or a utility function should look like. Uh, 
for the description of preferences over other things than commodities. Um, theory is uh, pretty empty on that. Um, and um, there is some work to be done on the uh, choice uh, parameters, uh, partly some em empirical work, but also some, some ethical work. One thing that is worth mentioning, I just mentioned this idea of computing equivalent income with one reference or one set of references. You can actually use a whole range of references and compute the average equivalent income for various references. That still gives you a utility representation. And it's still perhaps uh, meaningful to compare people's situations according to this average thing over that uses an average over various uh, references. Uh, that's something to be thought about. No axiomatic work exists that would justify that, and that's an open, uh, an open question. Something I didn't mention at all in my empirical uh, illustrations is lifetime evaluation. Presumably, uh, the evaluation of life is about not just the moment, but uh, the past and the possible futures. Um, it would be nice to, to be able to do something about that. Unfortunately, uh, very little is, is, yet, uh, is yet done. And I stop here. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>